from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everyone. And if you've, if you've been sitting here for the last few hours, I guess welcome doesn't apply, but thank you for coming. Welcome to me, because I just got here. My name is John Kelly. I'm a columnist at the Washington Post, and I want to thank everybody for coming to this, the 10th annual National Book Festival, which the Washington Post has been delighted to sponsor since the very beginning. We like when people read things, so thank you for reading things. I need to tell you, if you haven't heard it already, that this is being videotaped. And so uh, if uh, you are in the witness protection program or you're trying to hide from someone, you should be aware of that because you may show up uh, on, on camera. Also, when, when it's time to ask questions, we have microphones in the aisles so you can move to a microphone to ask your questions so everybody can hear you. I'm going to be introducing our next speaker and author, and I, I should say that Rosemary Wells has probably done more for rabbits than anyone since Beatrix Potter. Her Max and Ruby uh, books have entertained children since the first one came out in 1979, I think it was. She may also be the country's leading chronicler of noisy mice, curious West Highland terriers, and sushi-loving cats. But Rosemary Wells is phenomenally diverse with a body of work that includes not just books to be read to children, but books to be read by them and by their older brothers and sisters. From Red Moon at Sharpsburg, a young adult novel about the Civil War battle at Antietam, to My Havana, Memories of a Cuban Boyhood, a story inspired by and written with Secundino Fernandez, a Havana-born architect whose story captivated Wells, as well as, her, as her, uh, her latest book, On the Blue Comet. Original, sensitive, incisive, incisive versatile, wry. These are just some of the words used to describe her. Rosemary once wrote in the Washington Post, my childhood is irreplaceable and the greatest gift that I own. Through the more than 120 books she has written over the last 40 years, I think that she's given an immeasurable gift to countless other childhoods. So please welcome Rosemary Wells. It's, it's really hard for me to believe any of that. Um, to me, I'm just the, the mother who used to do the late away games driving for, say, for Sacred Heart for my kids in soccer and lacrosse. I used to have to go all over Westchester County to unknown schools and pick up about seven girls because I was qualified to, to drive a van. And that's who I really am. <laughs> I wanted to, uh, in this late afternoon on this hot, hot, beautiful day at this wonderful uh, symposium, give a little thanks out First, to the marvelous red-shirted volunteers who proliferate all over this <laughs> wonderful fair. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you for your love of books, or I know you wouldn't be here. There's another person who is not here uh, in this audience, uh, I'm quite sure, but I think that she deserves a little bit of thanks, too. I believe that the greatest legacy of the Bush administration was Laura Bush's festival. <laughs> um, I had an interview earlier today with, with a couple of wonderful uh, writers from, from a magazine that, that is uh, basically uh, the magazine that preschool teachers enjoy and, and read and write letters to. And they asked me if I had, uh, are these microphones loud enough? Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, they asked me if I would say anything about using books with kids and, and the reason to do it and how to do it and, and that kind of a question. And I wanted to answer it and, and hope that there's lots of teachers in this audience. Are there teachers in this audience? Bless you. You are. 
You are the most important professionals in American life today. In your hands, in your hands are our young people and our future. And I do wish you were all paid as well as lawyers. We'll get back to the teachers in a minute because I love teachers and I love to advocate for teachers. And the one terrific thing that I, I like about being a writer is no one can really fire me so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> At any rate, I, I uh, answered these two lovely young teachers this morning by saying, all I ever intend to do with Max and Ruby or with the Blue Comet or anything else I write and illustrate is to cause children to open a book and look at those pages and love what's inside. And to love the privacy that a book gives. I always write for the most intelligent child. I never dumb anything down like the TV does. TV does nothing but dumb things down. They write for children so dumb that those children don't even exist. I write for the brightest child knowing that that bright child can live right here in DC, that bright child can come from the South Bronx or the furthest reaches of rural America. I don't know where, but the poorest, poorest areas. And I know that child is there and that's the child I write for. I want them to open those pages and I want them to love what they find. And not just my books, any books. I want them to love books. I don't want to write, write a book about what you should do or should think or should feel. I never do that. I write, a, really, Max and Ruby is nonfiction. <laughs> if you think about it. <laughs> if you think about it, because it's all real. It's all my kids and, and, uh, and uh, universalized. Um, and, and I just want children to to have that great joy that I had when I was little and I opened, cracked the pages of a Nancy Drew. There was no greater joy. No greater joy in my life than one night I remember uh, when my daughter was about nine, my Vic daughter Victoria was about nine years old and I wanted her to go to bed and she had to get up early and I was yelling at the bottom of the stairs. I said, sweetheart, it is long past time for bed and I see that crack of light under your door. Nothing happened. I said, five minutes and that's it. Six minutes passed and I had to go up there finally and I knocked on the door I said, it is time for bed. You have a math test tomorrow, and you know when the bus comes, and you're not going to get your sleep, and you have to eat your breakfast. She looked up, startled. There she was with a Nancy Drew in her, in her lap. And um, not, you might notice, a vampire novel or a dystopian novel. Uh, she was there uh, with a Nancy Drew, and she said, Oh, Ma, I'm so sorry. I didn't really hear you because nothing in the room existed. Even I didn't exist, only what's in this book. I was gone. And the thing, you know, you never can, you never can prevent what you really think. And it just goes skipping through your head without any warning. And I said, okay, I can die now. <laughs> Back to those teachers. Critical thinking is what they're going to get when they love books. They're not going to open a book if they don't love it. They're not going to open a book if you whip the book to death with questions and all kinds of things that invades the privacy of the reader and the story. With all these prepared teacher questions, it's just terrible. Children hate them. Uh, they want that book to be a private thing. Unfortunately, a great many of them don't have the privacy of reading by themselves or the privacy of reading with a parent. And it's up to the teacher to do it. There are three things that happen to those children and they are totally important. One is the art of critical thinking. 
the art of not following, say, a politician and voting for that politician who talks in bumper stickers and talks about and talks and talks unfairly and, and hatefully to other politicians. That child is going to critically think right around that and say, you know, I want to hear the other side of this question. I want to hear the other point of view. That's what a reader is. A reader is also someone who escapes. The richest children among us still want to escape. They still want to escape from something. No matter what it is, they want to escape. And that's what books give us. And it also gives us a private scaffold to adventure and knowledge. And when I, I use the word scaffold very, very carefully because it's an educationese word, and I don't like educationese very much at all. I speak the English of my grandmother. I speak the English language of 1943, and I haven't changed a thing, but I will, I will use the word scaffold because it is the difference between television and books. Television is not scaffold, scaffolded to the individual child. That child's interests, that child's reading skills, that child's abilities. The child can pick from hundreds of books and find the book that's right for them. And the books give them a scaffolded bridge of safety with handrails to escape, to gain knowledge, and to simply have fun. All I can do is make it fun to open those covers, and that's what I hope to do. I have the privilege of speaking a little bit earlier to one of our most distinguished guests who's sitting somewhere in this audience. I won't point her out, but she is the daughter of a great president. He was born in Texas. He would never have made it to Congress or the first thing without a tremendous drive for education, without books and libraries. And we're not going to have a generation of children who are of this kind at all unless we get them back into books. I worry about our democracy. <coughs> you will excuse me, I'm a grandmother to four. And they pick up things in, in school that grab hold of the sinuses of the adults that are just terrible. So I'm going to, I think I have a little water here. We are in danger of losing this wonderful democracy of ours. The one solution and the one thing that's going to save it is education and books. Because you can't have a democracy without an educated population and without critical thinkers. It means hard work. It means not allowing video games in your home. You can't prevent them, but you can not allow them in your home. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm really sorry. I'm doing the best I can. I, I think that uh, the value of the book and the value of the educated parent and the participatory parent cannot be overstated. It's very interesting. There's a recent, um, this week, uh, Sunday morning program. Again, excuse me. That's wonderful, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> A recent <coughs> Sunday morning Christine Amanpour program on education had the three biggies. Arnie Duncan, Michelle Ree, bless her, and Randy Weingarten. These are the three big educational movers and shakers in the United States at this time.
They talked about funding. They talked about unions. They talked about teachers. They talked about Michelle's plan to reward good teachers and basically get rid of the ones who were not, thank you, who were not up to snuff. I don't disagree with that. I think it's a good plan. I do think that the teachers' union has overdone their protection of teachers, whether good or bad. And the research will show how important a good teacher is, particularly to a child who is poor and from the ghetto. This couldn't be better stated, apparently, I haven't seen it yet, but in the movie Waiting for Superman, which is coming to all the theaters. But I noticed one thing about the conversation. The three biggest educational movers and shakers in this country never mentioned the contribution of parents. This is critical. The best teacher in the world can't overcome a parent who simply turns on the television or doesn't read to their children. This is something <laughs> This is something that we need to get out there. And I have to say I've seen a couple of big changes in my time as an American that I never believed would happen. Again, excuse me. When I was little, We used to have Sunday lunch at my grandmother's big house by the sea. And the room was always blue with smoke. And there would be the rattle of old-fashioned glasses with ice. And we'd sit down to lunch to roast pork and creamed spinach and other things like that. And those sweet people would never have believed that you could get Americans going and running around like rabbits. <coughs> that America would, at least a lot of us, completely give up the drinking and smoking or drinking to excess. None of them would have believed it. We can do this. We can do this in this country. But it's a great unmentionable to talk about the parents and their contribution. And I think we need to be frank and honest and come out with this. Again, excuse me. <laughs> Two courses of antibiotics <laughs> didn't do any good. 30 days. And I'm just getting over it. So today, I brought you three new books. I'm going to check the time. I'm also going to answer questions. So very quickly, this is Max and Ruby. It's Max and Ruby's bedtime book. And it's three stories instead of one. I had some stories that I'd wanted to make into picture books. And they never really gelled because they weren't long enough. Again, excuse me. They weren't really long enough. So I collected them and I thought about them and I made them into shorter stories. And so you'll find them all here. They are Ruby's Restaurant. I know you can't see it. And I had intended to have a PowerPoint show. But Ruby's Restaurant is all about Ruby and Louise, her best friend, and how they open a cafe with grandma as the one eater or client, customer. And they forget completely 
with their huge store of rubber food. Now, people ask me, how do my children, how do my children uh, contribute to, to the ideas for books? Well, I have uh, twin granddaughters, and they own probably about 30 different pieces of rubber food. <laughs> it's wonderful. They have rubber hamburgers. They have rubber sushi. They have rubber lettuce, rubber milk, rubber butter. It's just wonderful what they make. And they make these huge meals out of this rubber food. So that's right in this book. But Ruby and Louise forget entirely about dessert. So it is left to Max to go upstairs and to take the bottle of baby shampoo and to go into the potting shed and to mix it with potting soil, which he does, and make the most wonderful chocolate mousse, <laughs> which he serves to his grandmother. And of course, she's thrilled. There's another story in here about Max rescuing, uh, a, um, rescuing a dolly of his, uh, of his sister's best friend, little sister, and then another one about Max goes to school. That is Max. I have two other books that I would like to bring to you because I know I'm known for picture books, but I also am a very ardent novel writer. This one, again, no vampires and no dystopia. A very positive and cheerful book, nonetheless, a time travel book with a big crime in the middle of it and set in our depression era in the 1920s in Cairo, Illinois, Hollywood, and New York. I wish I had time to read you a little of it, but my voice is not good enough to honor the book. So I'll put it aside. And then the last one, I think there are some copies left. <coughs> This one is called My Havana. About five years ago, I was listening to NPR and heard the story just in five minutes of a man who had left Cuba, I think as a nine-year-old, when Castro came in. And the thing in his story that stuck with me <coughs> for a the next four years was how much he missed his beautiful city of Havana and how much he pined for it and how cold and gray and icy New York was where his family had to go. So this was 1958. <clears throat> New York did not necessarily welcome Hispanics. Excuse me. And he was not a happy camper. <clears throat> Nonetheless, he built out of cardboard an entire city of Havana on his bedroom floor. It was a miracle. And by spring, he'd made a best friend and learned about Coney Island and the fact that New York, too, could be warm and had a beach. The story stayed with me. I couldn't find Dino Fernandez. I had his name wrong. But I finally did find him and wrote his story. At this point, I will ask for some questions and do my best to answer them. Again, forgive me. I have not been coughing very much today, but it's the speaking So let's see if anyone has some questions. And I'll do my best to answer them. How yes. did you get the idea for writing Ruby and Max? Ruby and Max are my own two children. And can you believe it? 
Ruby is 37 years old, <laughs> mother of three, and still really bossy. Max is 32 years old and teaches horticulture at Cornell and is still really dirty. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> yes? What inspired you for the um, Bunny Cakes book? The Bunny Cakes books? I can't even tell you. These books, they just come to me. Have you ever seen an airport where the planes are in the air and you see the lights of the planes and the planes start to land? There's three, four, five, six planes out there. Well, that's how the ideas are. They come out of the clouds and they try to land at my airport. Now, I have a lot of books going all the time. And sometimes they have to go in a holding pattern. <laughs> and then they say, you better let me land or I'll go down to the Kevin Henkes airport. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to say first, thank you so much for um, coming and talking to us today with such great spirit, even though you're not feeling too great. I feel just fine. This is an attack. And of <laughs> course, it would come at the time where I'm speaking to all of you. I feel fine. This doesn't hurt. It just is really annoying. And secondly, I wanted to ask the title of your new time travel book. A title for what? The time travel book that's, um, that you brought to show us today. On the Blue Comet. Thank it's you. about Oscar Ogilvie, who's, not, who's 11 years old, lives in Cairo, Illinois, and has the most wonderful train set, which he runs with his father. Good afternoon. I'd like to know how long you've been writing, what were you doing prior to, and how did you feel about the rejections you got when you first submitted your work? I was very fortunate. Excuse me for a minute. I was very fortunate in that I worked for the publisher who first published me. Wonderful. <laughs> and I didn't have any rejections. Wonderful. If I had them, knowing me, I would have felt terrible. But I didn't have any. I learned how to do it because I was in publishing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm sorry to come to you with such a terrible cold. Um, Thank you for being so understanding. Yes, another question. Yes. Um, when did you start writing the Max and Ruby books? When my daughters were uh, nine months old and five years old. And that was about 30 years ago. Yes. What is your favorite book? What is my favorite book? The ones that I've written? Oh. Right now, On the Blue Comet and Max and Ruby's Bedtime Book. <laughs> Thank you. I do not necessarily have a question. I just want to thank you for bringing such joy to our family. And I also want to thank you for your words today, recognizing the part a parent takes in a child's life. And I hope you get better soon. God bless you. I will get better soon. I'm so terribly sorry. But as you can imagine, everybody here has had a terrible cold. And uh, you all know what it's like. Again, there are a lot of people with questions. I would like to take them all. I would just like to re-emphasize the main point of what I came here to say, which is our parents need to step up with our kids, for our teachers. You know, <coughs> there's a, um, a big scandal about a uh, Los Angeles Times article that rated teachers publicly from bad to good. And there was a lot of talk about whether this was fair and whether it was right. And I don't know whether it was fair or right, 
but I don't think you should rate those teachers without rating the parents. I think we should. Uh, I think we should talk about how our parent, whether our parents are sending our kids to school prepared. It's about all I can say. My time is up. I thank you so much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.